Hi everyone, and welcome to today's session on ESOPs or Employee Share Option Plans. Every startup's got one, but they're not very easy to implement. Rewind three years to when we started Cake and ESOPs would take months. We were really having to grapple with all the, all the different technical aspects and, and individual nuances of, of so many variables, but we really have got ESOPs down to a fine art now at Cake. There's, there's lots of stuff you need to learn. Today, we're gonna to cover maybe 20 or 30 minutes of, of sort of information around why to implement an ESOP and how. And of course, the Cake software itself automates and streamlines a lot of that stuff. Um, so check that out uh, when you get a chance. But um, let's get into today's session. Thanks for being here. And um, yeah, get a pen and paper and take some notes along the way. So how to build a better team with employee shares? A little disclaimer there. <laughs> you might need to um, screenshot that if you really want to check that out, but this is not legal or technical advice. So one of the most important things in our opinion at Cake around equity for startups is just to simplify and streamline so many of the steps. Just remove the steps altogether. What lawyers and accountants and, and founders have been doing for a long time is just taking too long to do things. But at Cake, it's really, really highly streamlined and simplified. With ESOPs in general, today we're gonna to cover why do you wanna have an ESOP? It, it is quite a bit of work, even with great software, but they're really, really beneficial for your startup. And then how do we put it all together? So with regard to why you want one, it helps you attract great people, helps you save money, it helps you retain key staff, helps you increase productivity, you can share in the success of your startup with your team, and it saves you tax. It also makes you better looking, not sure about that, but considering it does all these other things, I wouldn't be surprised. So according to this FinTech Australia report, you know, 41% of fintechs find it difficult to attract, you know, really good employees. So with your ESOP, you're able to, you know, really attract better people, you know, really powerful, creative people that want to change the world. They want a bit of skin in the game. So when you're, you know, putting that job ad out there and having those interviews, being able to say to these great people that they get a percentage in the company and that you're gonna increase the value of the company over time and they can benefit from that and participate in making that happen, it really does help you attract, you know, those heavy lifters that you need in startup land. Also helping with your runway as well, you know, Runway runs out really quickly in a startup. Most things take twice as long and are twice as hard as we think. So being able to balance out the remuneration between cash and equity is a really you know, important uh, financial aspect to running your startup. We're not saying here to underpay people by any stretch, but you know, being in startup land is quite, quite often difficult to compete against say a corporate or enterprise salary. But you know, a combination of salary and, and options is a really, really good way to balance out your runway. So what about retention? You know, employees are a company's greatest asset has never been more true than in a startup. The first two, three, four years of your company, almost all the power of your startup is in your team. As your product gets better and better and your brand gets better and better, of course, value moves across to those areas as well. But it's the people that are you know, out there bringing the customers in, onboarding them, making sure the customer success is bang on. You know, it's, it's super, super critical. So you wanna be able to keep those great people for three or four years. How do you do that? With your ESOP, you can build in vesting rules that match to those time horizons. So for example, in the first 12 months, you know, there's no options for the new employees. You know, there's the, it was called a cliff but there's a three to four year period in total. So it's much more likely that your team are gonna stay for that three to four year period. If they've got options, they can see what they're worth 
and they know that by achieving the milestones of the company, the value of those options is going up each year. It's really, really great way to keep your team um, retained. So productivity as well. So some great studies out of the UK here showing, you know, really high single digit productivity increases. What startup doesn't want these sorts of additional benefits in their company? And it's not that hard to understand, you know, owners do think differently. And so by having an ownership structure around your startup, as opposed to the very old hierarchical sort of owner employee vibe that's quite common, uh, but not so much in startup land. It just means that, you know, your team are going to feel more aligned. They're going to speak up more and, and they're really going to help you do the heavy lifting that you need through those really difficult first few years and beyond. So I assume now that you're convinced, what's the recipe? So there's two distinct parts to implementing and running an employee share option plan. It's really common for the technical part to dominate and the people part to be almost completely forgotten. This is a huge, huge mistake, huge mistake that we see happening all the time. And without trying to hassle professional services firms, if you just go to your professional services firm and they give you plan rules and you know, your resolution and your tax advice, and then you go to your employees and you say, here's some legal and financial and tax documents, sign these, your ESOP will not work. It will, all these things I talked about before at the start here, they're not gonna happen, except for the last one. Oh no, that saves you tax. So you need to do these people things to make sure your ESOP is getting value for the company. So think about it for a second from a company perspective. You're allocating 10% of the equity in your company to your ESOP. So say a seed round pre-money valuation of $5 million, that's $500,000 of your company you've allocated to this ESOP. If you just go and get plan rules and get some tax advice and stick it in front of your employees and you don't do these things, it's highly likely that that $500,000 has gone out and you've got no value for it whatsoever. And worst of all, when your company does really well and it's worth 10 or 20 times that in the future, there's a huge amount of value that's been wasted here. So coming back to the people part then, what we need to do is we need to focus on building a great team, making sure we're engaging and retaining for the future and that we're helping them share in the company's success. We need to have a change management mindset around this. Make sure that you're doing, you know, telling your employees why you're implementing this, explaining to them what the company's equity is currently worth and how next time you raise, it's gonna go up 100% or more and so on and so forth. Make sure they're coming on that journey with you and that they know what's going on. Things like transparency as well. You wanna make sure that everyone in your team understands how the scheme works and that it's set very fairly. Some things that you can do here, for example, as well, is you can, um, you can make sure that if the founder has an exit, the team have an exit and that they know that so that they feel like you're all in it together. It's really, really important. <laughs> there is a lot to do um, with your ESOP, as I said before, um, and some many startups now have international teams. So I'm not going to sugarcoat it and say that you know it's it's super super easy. Um, with Cake, it's much easier than ever before because we've streamlined and automated many of the steps. But there is quite a bit to do. Um, it is important that you do it properly and that you don't do it with handshakes. The reason being the plan rules act as like a shareholders agreement for the ESOP. So it helps you handle good levers and bad levers. And it's like a rule book for how the employee share option plan is gonna run. And it makes sure that there's a nice, easy way to administrate everything between you and the employees. And trust me, once you've got 10, 20 employees and people coming and going, you'll be very thankful that you put it in place properly on the, in the first place so that you can handle all these things really seamlessly when they come up. So how much do you allocate um, as you're going through? So right in the beginning, I always advocate that you set up a 10% ESOP almost on day one. Why? Very early stage companies really need great advisors, but you don't wanna essentially have them working for free and you don't really want um, to pay them cash because you don't have much cash. So 
giving them an allocation in your ESOP, maybe half to one and a half percent over three years is a really great way to professionally allocate some of your options to your advisors. Your first hires, definitely, this is when you have the least cash, right? Um, you know, you've got 200K in your first round or 400K. The last thing you wanna be doing is paying, you know, top dollar month on month, you know, for, for everybody on your team. You need to make that cash go as long as possible. So, you know, do balance things out with a bit of sweat equity. Please don't take it too far and underpay people and, and take the piss. <laughs> excuse my French, but um, you know, balancing out the cash and equity component um, is really, really important and you can use the ESOP for that. And then you don't have handshake agreements. Handshake agreements don't really work. No one really trusts it. They're not gonna value it. And who hasn't heard of the circumstance where, you know, such and such did 10 or 20 or 50K work for a startup and then the startup goes on to do really well, but they didn't ever have any agreement in place and then they miss out. We do not want to see that in the ecosystem. We really want to make sure everyone's rewarded for their contributions and your ESOP's a great way to do that. With Cake as well, uh, if you have less than five investors, this would be free. You can set up a whole ESOP for free um, and you can start issuing the offer letters. It's a wonderful way to keep your cap table in good shape, um, working towards your future rounds. So yeah, so using the same ESOP probably all the way through here, normally around series A, you've run out. So you've used your 10% allocation. The professional investors coming in, they'll wanna see the ESOP reset so that you have enough um, equity as options in the pool to be able to go out and, and get those new hires onboarded and make sure they've got all got an allocation in the ESOP so they're engaged and retained and, and firing hard. So the technical timeline, you can see at the bottom here, there's a setup phase and an active phase. So in the setup phase, you choose your plan rules. So with Cake, you can do that in one click to choose the standard plan rules, or you can go to one of our partner panel of lawyers to have a fixed price, fixed scope set of um, legal work done, or you can do it yourself or you can work with your own lawyer, that's totally fine, but you do need to spend a little bit of time locking in those rules. Then the company signs a member's resolution, which essentially says, you know, we, the shareholders of the company, implement this scheme um, under these rules and it's this many options. Once that's done, you do need to get a valuation of the options, the exercise price, so that you abide by the regulatory and tax situation in your country. Then you're ready to send the offer letters to your team. So this is the active phase. So your ESOP is set up and you're actually sending letters out to your team to say, you know, this is how many options you get. These are the vesting rules. And, so, and you actually send the rules, the plan rules with the letter so that they know what's going on. This, remember, this is the technical timeline. I'm going to talk to the people timeline. You wouldn't want to just say so what, what can happen if you don't do it well is you do all this bit and then your team is like freaked out. You've just given them options. They think they've got a tax bill. They don't know what it means. They've got to go to their accountant. They've got to spend money to understand it. You don't want to be scaring your team with stuff like that. You really want to make sure you get that right. I'm going to go through that on the next slide. So then after you've sent the letters, then you have what's called vesting. A vesting is a technical term. Essentially, it's when the team member earns their options. So when the options kind of go from being still owned by the company to really owned and controlled by the employee. After that, they can choose to exercise their options. There is a payment required at that point. Uh, I won't go into that right now. And then after they've been exercised, they actually become shares in the company. And there's normally ongoing regulatory reporting for the company with the regulator and, and the tax body in your country. So here we're gonna talk about the people timeline. This is quite often forgotten, but it's critical as well. There's a setup and an active phase for the people timeline too. So create a company strategy around your ESOP. So what's the dollar value gonna be? How are you gonna communicate the value of your, your ESOP? And then how are you gonna communicate that you know, going forward? How are you gonna tie it into remuneration strategy? How are you gonna tie it into performance reporting? You know, are you gonna have time-based vesting? Are you gonna have milestone-based vesting? So spend some time, build a strategy around this. It's gonna really make sure your ESOP is, is much, much better. And you're gonna get all those really powerful benefits as opposed to it being sort of clunky and broken and, and you know, really draining value out of the company. 
Um, so then before, so when you're in the setup phase, make sure you're, you know, you're communicating with your team, get emails out, have meetings, send them frequently asked questions, make sure everybody feels really comfortable with what's going on, make sure they're buying into the company strategy of why it's in place in the first place. Then you go into the active phase, so you get the offer letters out and they're signed. You need to keep the vesting up to date. If your employee has options, but they never hear from you again, what are they going to think about where their options are? Are they going to think they're valuable? Are they going to think that you're going to honor them? Are they going to think that they might be, you know, just disappear at some point? They're going to think these things, even, even I reckon the most positive employees are going to have these doubts. So you want to make sure they know, all right, my vesting's happening every month or I've hit my milestone, so now my vesting's happening. They're also going to want to know how the company's going. So treat them like shareholders, you know, have like an ownership mindset within your startup. If the company's worth 10 million now and it used to be worth 5 million and the value of their options just doubled, they're going to really want to know that. So make sure you're communicating that. It's going to, you know, really help um, them to be feeling rewarded, plus also helps the company. Everybody's rowing harder um, towards the next big goal. Yeah, so I guess that last point's really similar. So maintaining a growth narrative in the same way that you would your investors. So these sorts of things are really gonna help you to make sure your ESOP is awesome. So how about some use cases? So founders, not normally. Um, look, depending on what country you're in, there's gonna be slightly different rules around this. Um, you probably can have a separate ESOP for the founders to the team. Um, advisors and advisory board, definitely, you know, it's a great way to keep them engaged. Um, do make sure that you have vesting on that though. You don't want, you know, one and a half percent of your equity going out to some advisor that's not doing anything. So make sure you've got monthly or quarterly catch-ups with your advisors where you're talking to them about how much equity they've earned and what milestones they've achieved and what milestones they have for the next quarter. First five employees, definitely. These guys quite often getting, you know, a larger percentage, maybe 1% each over three to four years with a 12 month cliff. That gets that buy-in and that retention uh, that you really want from your ESOP. When you're scaling your team, you've normally set up your second ESOP at this point or somewhere around this time. So you're going from say 10 employees to 20, 30, 40 employees. You quite often, um, Basing the amount of options, the number of options and the dollar value of options now based on their, you know, the valuation of the company versus their pay and bonus structure. So if they're on $100,000 and you want them to have $20,000 worth of options per, per year, you can just calculate that 25,000 over the, the pre-money valuation of your last round. So it does get a little bit easier to calculate things um, on a pretty sort of strict financial basis as part of a remuneration or compensation package once you're scaling your team. Contractors quite often can, can go in these ESOPs as well. I know in Australia for sure, um, you know, individual contractors can be um, built into your ESOP. And with sweat equity, absolutely. The more you can get professional agreements around how people earn equity um, from your company, and then again, they can feel it going up in value over time. If you're communicating with them well, makes them much more likely to keep working with you quarter after quarter and year after year than doing one project, getting no agreement from you, and then not hearing from you. And then you go to ask them for more work, they're much less inclined you know, to gonna wanna come back and participate. So what about valuations? Um, there's normally a couple of different valuations. So you're the normal valuation of the startup. So what did we raise money at last time at our seed round or our series A or whatever? So, you know, those are done via, you know, traditional methods. There's Equidam software for that. You can use the Berkus method to discount a cash flow depending on what stage you're at. There's normally a separate valuation for your, the exercise price of your option. In each country, it's slightly different. In Australia, we've got special rules from the tax office. I know you've got the 409A in the US. So there's some specific rules about how you calculate the valuation normally off the balance sheet. So make sure you take the time to understand what those two different valuations are. There's also a lot of leverage between those valuations in a startup. You know, if your balance sheet shows you've got hundred grand and you're raising at 10 million, you've got $9.9 .9 million of leverage when you're issuing those options. That's a lot of value that you're able to create 
um, by issuing those options. So really understand that that leverage is there, but then make sure you implement it well and you maintain it well and you keep the narrative up. Otherwise, all that value that you've implemented is not really actually getting you um, the results that you need. And it, from a shareholder perspective, it can be, can be actually eroding value. So yeah, I mean, Culture in startups, I mean, it's it's kind of one of the most important things. It gets talked about constantly. Um, you know, having your employees, your team, um, your advisors be part of the ownership group in your company, you know, and having that ownership culture and mindset is a super powerful driver. Um, you know, so I really do highly recommend getting involved and sharing in the success. I mean, who wants to be a founder that creates a $100 million company and then keeps all the money for himself? I think it would be a super sad outcome. I know a cake, we'd be pretty devoted. So, you know, you want to make sure that when you're successful, you know, you can create life-changing events for, for lots of your team members, um, you know, and from an ecosystem perspective, which is a little bit more of a cake thing, you know, then that, that, that sort of success can come around and fund more startups and more innovation, which is, you know, pretty exciting for a lot of us as well. And I guess getting close to finishing up now and thinking about your own team's well-being, if you look at these sort of five top factors for what creates sort of meaning and, and positivity around, you know, a team role, financial payoff, fair treatment, a sense of community, employee influence on management. So these are all driven by having an ownership culture and having an ESOP implemented. So it really is a powerful tool. Um, certainly want to know that you're keen to check out by being here, but make sure you take the plunge. Yeah, so Cake works well with partners around the world. Um, just find, talk to us uh, if you don't know of a partner in your area and we'll be able to find one for you. With Cake, you have a lot more peace of mind. We do simplify and streamline your equity like crazy. So definitely check it out. All right, we've come to the end of the session for today. Thanks very much for being here. We've tried to share a bunch of information that's gonna help you on your way. Remember to get the people timeline and the technical timeline running at the same time to get the most out of your ESOP. Good luck implementing an ownership culture in your startup. Reach out to Cake if you need anything. We have streamlined ESOPs, you know, down to a much, much easier thing to implement these days. And I'll catch you next time.